Monsieur le Premier ministre, nous sommes prêts à commencer lorsque, lorsque vous voulez. Oui, non, on est, on est bon à commencer. Thank you. We'll start with questions on the phone for media. Operator, over to you. Thank you, merci. You may press star one at this time if you have a question. Vous pouvez appuyer sur étoile 1 si vous avez une question. La première question de Mélanie Marquis, la presse. La parole est à vous. Merci. Bonjour, M. Trudeau. Le, le NPD demande de la tenue d'un débat d'urgence aujourd'hui en Chambre. Est-ce que le Parti libéral va appuyer la requête? Et puis, au, au niveau gouvernemental, vous venez de, de promettre ou d'évoquer des actions concrètes. Pouvez-vous être plus concret et précis? D'abord, je pense que tous les Canadiens sont ahuris de voir ces nouvelles sortir de Kamloops. On ne peut pas imaginer 215 enfants qui, qui ont été enlevés de leur famille et qui leurs familles n'ont en général même pas été informées qu'ils qu étaient décédés, comme, comme on a vu dans bien des situations, pas seulement à Kamloops, mais à travers le pays. La réalité des écoles résidentielles, c'était ça. Des enfants enlevés de leur famille, de leur communauté, de leur langue, de leur culture, envoyés à des institutions lointaines, et s'ils revenaient, ils revenaient souvent avec euh, des... Euh, des blessures profondes, visibles et invisibles, et mais il y en avait beaucoup qui ne revenaient pas. Et leurs familles souvent n'étaient pas informées de où ils étaient ou ce qui s'était passé. Ça fait partie de la vérité que nous devons reconnaître de l'histoire de ce pays, de l'échec épouvantable dans nos relations avec les peuples autochtones dans ce pays. C'est pour ça la Commission de la vérité et de la réconciliation a mis de l'avant des recommandations, des mesures importantes pour reconnaître la vérité en tant que Canadien et pour réparer et rebâtir ces relations basées sur le respect, sur le partenariat, sur la garde partagée de ce pays extraordinaire, de ce territoire extraordinaire. Euh, oui, j'espère qu'on va avoir des débats, incluant des débats d'urgence. Et, et oui, il y aura encore des actions concrètes pour les familles, pour les survivants, pour les communautés autochtones. Ça fait six ans qu'on travaille fort sur la réconciliation, mais on sait qu'il reste encore énormément à faire et on va continuer de le faire. Oui, bien, quand, quand vous parlez d'action concrète, qu'est-ce que vous voulez dire exactement? Puis est-ce que c'est spécifiquement pour cette communauté-là à Kamloops euh, qui a été affectée? Effectivement, il va falloir avoir des actions concrètes pour ces communautés-là. Mais il y a deux ans, dans notre budget, on avait mis de l'argent pour reconnaître les cimetières associés aux, aux écoles résidentielles pour aider avec ces blessures profondes que les familles, que les communautés, le, le traumatisme intergénérationnel qui, qui endure et qui s'articule aujourd'hui de maintes différentes façons en termes de troubles de santé mentale, euh, cycle de, de, de pauvreté ou de, euh, de, de, de toxicomanie, euh, de, de violence même. Nous avons des grands défis euh, en, tant que, en tant que pays euh, pour bien appuyer, pour être là et pour euh, redonner le, le leadership de leurs enfants, de leur communauté euh, au peuple autochtone. C'est pour ça, entre autres, euh, qu'on a avancé avec une transformation euh, des, euh, des, de la service de protection des enfants avec la loi 80 12, qui donnent aux communautés le contrôle de leurs enfants pour pas qu'on enlève des enfants, même aujourd'hui, de leur communauté quand ils sont dans des situations difficiles, mais qu'on fasse confiance pour travailler avec la communauté pour pas que les enfants soient enlevés de leur langue, de leur culture. C'est des mesures que nous avions prises, mais évidemment, ça va en prendre d'autres. Et je sais que cette, cette, ces derniers jours ont été un peu... Un un éveil pour beaucoup de Canadiens non autochtones euh, qui, oui, connaissaient que qu'il y avait des, des écoles résidentielles, mais ne comprenaient pas à quel point c'était horrifique cette réalité que vivaient des enfants autochtones et leurs familles et leurs communautés. Merci. Prochaine question. Au revoir. La prochaine question est de Dylan Robertson, 
from the Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. Prime Minister, certain First Nations want federal funding to undertake research and excavation of residential school burial sites across Canada. Will you pay for this? I think that is an important part of discovering the truth. Uh, we have, as I said, already put money uh, forward uh, a few budgets ago uh, on uh, initiatives around uh, residential school cemeteries. Uh, there is obviously more to do, and I think uh, there there will be more that we will do. Uh, we have committed as a government uh, to be there for reconciliation, but also to be there for truth, uh, and that is uh, an important step. So, uh, yes, we will be there to work with communities on uh, the things Things they need and on the things we all need to know. Follow up, Don. And Prime Minister, advocates say that Ottawa needs to lead a standardized process to ensure that evidence is properly gathered at mass graves, not just cemeteries, instead of leaving that up to a patchwork province uh, approach. Uh, have you had any, uh, have you tasked any federal departments to start coming up with standards? Uh, I know that uh, Ministers Miller, Minister Bennett, uh, and Minister Vandal uh, are deeply engaged in this issue, and uh, we are looking for how we can support uh, Indigenous communities in their grief and in their requests for answers. Uh, I know there will be many, many discussions to be had in the coming days and weeks about how we can best uh, support these communities and get to the truth. I think the proposal around a standardized approach makes a lot of sense, but of course, uh, we will work with the provinces and territories to make sure that we're all doing the right thing. Thank you. Next question, operator. The next question is from uh, Annie Bergeron Oliver from CTV National News. Please go ahead. Hi, Prime Minister. Thank you for taking my question. I just want to follow up on what my colleague Dylan said. Will you commit to helping Indigenous communities conduct an examination and investigation of every former residential school site? Uh, we are committed to reconciliation. We are committed to truth. We are committed to being there uh, to help uh, Indigenous communities uh, understand the past and move forward into the future the right way. Uh, and as they uh, make requests, as there is a need for discovering more, we will continue to be there. Um, you know, we haven't looked at exactly what the processes or the, the needs are entirely, uh, but Canada will be there uh, to support uh, Indigenous communities as we uh, discover the extent of this trauma and trying to try to, to give opportunities for families and communities to heal. Follow-up? And as my follow-up, yes, uh, you say that there is more to do. What specifically are you talking about when you say there is more for the government to do? And I know you have that meeting today with Minister Bennett and Minister Miller. What are your focus priorities going to be for that meeting on how you can help immediately and in the long term? Well, what is there more to do on reconciliation? An awful lot. Uh, we need to continue to close the socioeconomic gaps uh, within uh, Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities. We need to be investing uh, in Indigenous entrepreneurship programs, which we already have, but we need to move forward. We need to make sure there are better schools uh, and better supports for child and family services as we move forward on Bill uh, C-92 uh, last year and are implementing that, but there's still uh, certain work to be done with certain provinces and of making that a reality. Uh, we need to move forward to do a better job, even on top of Bill 91 that we passed, to recognize Indigenous languages and support those. We need to do uh, more uh, to support uh, residential school survivors and help with the healing process and, and go at the intergenerational trauma that exists right across the country in Indigenous communities. We need to do more on the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls uh, tragedy that it continues uh, to happen in this country. Uh, we know there's an important anniversary coming up later this week, and uh, we're going to continue uh, to invest and partner uh, with uh, Indigenous communities and activists to make sure uh, that we are responding and ending this this violence that continues to uh, uh, to run unchecked in too many parts of the country. Uh, we need to uh, continue uh, to work on uh, settling land claims and uh, moving forward on self-government agreements to get out from under the colonial relic that is the India the uh, the Indian Act. Uh, we know uh, that it's important that it be done at the pace 
of the communities themselves, that they be in charge of that process. But we need to be there uh, is, as full partners as they move towards self-government. Uh, we need to continue the work that we've done. We've lifted 107 uh, long-term boil water advisories. There's still more to do. We're going to continue to work on that. There are so many uh, things we need to continue to work on, and we will. This government is committed to reconciliation. We are committed to the truth. We are committed to the partnership that means the solutions will not be dictated from Ottawa, but, but will be worked on together with Indigenous communities. And I think this is uh, a, a moment in time, this horrific revelation from Kamloops um, is something that is striking uh, the hearts of Canadians from coast to coast to coast as uh, what a horrific reality residential schools were. This may not come as a tremendous surprise to many Indigenous Canadians who've long known the horrors and the trauma of loss of brothers and sisters and cousins and children in, uh, in uh, residential schools. Um, but Canadians may not, non-Indigenous Canadians may not have understood uh, the depth of the trauma uh, for those families, for the family members who survived, uh, for those who came through and watched uh, their schoolmates disappear uh, without a trace. These are the things that Canada is waking up to this week, and it's a difficult and hard uh, awakening, but it is one that we need to take as a responsibility to move forward even stronger on reconciliation. Merci. Prochaine question. Further. The next question is from Ryan Timilty from the National Post. Please go ahead. Sir, you're talking this morning about work going forward uh, to address this issue, to properly fund the search for mass graves and burial sites. Uh, but, you know, that call was made in 2009 with the original TRC report. Um, you know, there's a long-standing history here, and, and you've been in government for six years now. I'm wondering why only now are we discussing a proper search and proper funding uh, to locate these sites? That's actually not the case. Obviously, uh, this is a further part of, of the challenges that we're discovering and the moving forward on, and there will be more to do. But like I said, in a budget two years ago, uh, we talked specifically about this issue and put uh, millions of dollars forward to support uh, the issue of residential school ceremonies and uh, tracing and supporting families. Uh, this has been something we have been working very, very hard on uh, over the past six years in partnership with Indigenous Canadians. Uh, and I think it's an important moment for non-Indigenous Canadians to realize uh, the extent uh, and the need uh, for even more of this important work. Paul Fran? Yeah, the, the funding you're mentioning, uh, I believe, was the $33 million in Budget 2019 for a National Residential School Student Death Register. Uh, I know that work is underway, but it, it seems like there was also a need to actually do the search. And in the case of the Kamloops uh, discovery, that was search was funded by the provincial government. I mean, didn't you have a responsibility to act on this sooner than now? Uh, there are many, many different things to act on, and we've, of course, been working with provincial governments, particularly the government of BC, which has been a real leader uh, in reconciliation. And I, I, I fear, but also hope that we are going to see similar actions uh, from other governments across the country that will lead to discoveries of uh, even further tragedies. The reality is our focus over these past years has been on healing uh, challenges of the past and supporting uh, people who've been through the trauma, but also on investing in ending boil water advisories and investing in inter Indigenous entrepreneurship and settling land claims and moving forward on self-government agreements, on moving forward on concrete measures to end gender-based violence and to put an end to the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The work that we have done over the past number of years has been concrete and focused on bringing and supporting communities along on their path uh, to, uh, to, to success and to uh, moving, uh, moving beyond the Indian Act. Uh, but as you point out, Ryan, there are many, many different things we need to be working on, and uh, we are working on the full range of them, uh, and we will continue to do that with concrete, firm actions that we've taken in the past, but also will take going forward. Thank you. 
Next question, operator. La prochaine question est de Christian Noël, Radio-Canada. La parole est à vous. Bonjour, M. le Premier ministre. Euh, J'aimerais vous emmener sur un autre sujet, si vous me le permettez. Euh, les États-Unis signalent qu'ils sont prêts à ouvrir leurs frontières rapidement, peut-être même d'ici le mois de juillet, et à le faire unilatéralement. Est-ce que cette pression-là par le gouvernement américain vous rend inconfortable? Et allez-vous en parler avec Joe Biden au J'ai bien hâte euh, d'avoir de bonnes conversations avec euh, le président Biden et d'autres chefs au G7, et je suis certain que COVID et euh, la réouverture euh, de déplacements euh, internationaux va être un, un sujet de discussion. Depuis les débuts, le Canada a pris des décisions basées sur ce qui est dans l'intérêt des Canadiens. Mais aussi, Christian, je te rappelle que depuis le début, il y a eu des asymétries au niveau de la frontière américaine. Comme les gens savent très bien, euh, on ne peut pas rentrer au Canada à moins d'avoir euh, ou bien une exception rare ou bien euh, un travail essentiel. Euh, mais ce n'est pas la réalité pour les États-Unis qui n'ont mis aucune limite sur euh, les vols vers les États-Unis, même des Canadiens. Donc, des Canadiens ne pouvaient pas passer à la frontière euh, terrestre, mais ils pouvaient prendre des vols vers les États-Unis. Ce n'était pas du tout réciproque pour le Canada. Alors, nous allons travailler avec les États-Unis, évidemment, pour essayer d'aligner nos mesures dans la mesure du possible. Mais notre priorité absolue sera toujours la protection, la sécurité des Canadiens. On veut tous rouvrir, on veut tous se remettre à, à se déplacer bientôt, voir des amis, prendre des vacances, aller, aller, euh, aller en voyage, mais on ne veut pas avoir à refermer, resserrer parce qu'il y a eu une autre vague. C'est pour ça qu'on est tellement axé sur la baisse des cas qu'on doit voir partout au pays maintenant et la vaccination. On doit passer au-delà du 75 avec une première dose et s'approcher de, de deux doses à plus que 75 au mois de septembre. Ce qu'on peut faire avec les vaccins qui arrivent, on a 3 millions de vaccins qui arrivent dans le pays cette semaine. Euh, on sait qu'il y a beaucoup de travail à faire encore, mais on est sur la bonne voie, mais on va prendre nos décisions basées dans l'intérêt des Canadiens et non basées sur ce que d'autres pays veulent. Oui, s'il vous plaît, merci. L'industrie du tourisme, les villes transfrontalières aussi s'inquiètent qu'une ouverture à sens unique s'aduise à leur secteur ou à leur commerce ou à leur économie locale, est-ce que c'est un risque que vous êtes prêt à prendre? Euh, on, on a toujours été très, très conscient des impacts sur l'économie, des restrictions qu'on a dû faire. Mais ce qu'on est aussi en train d'apprendre et ce qu'on a vu tout au long de l'année, c'est que là où les gens ont misé trop sur la protection des entreprises euh, et de l'économie et pas sur la protection euh, de la santé des citoyens, non seulement la santé en souffre, mais l'économie finit par souffrir aussi. La meilleure façon d'assurer une économie forte pendant qu'on traverse et surtout une fois qu'on aura fini avec cette pandémie, c'est de s'assurer que le contrôle des cas, le contrôle des virus soit maximal. C'est exactement pour ça qu'on on, on fait très attention et les provinces à travers le pays euh, en général, font très attention de rouvrir de façon graduelle et, et, et attentionnée pour s'assurer justement que, oui, c'est sûr qu'il y a des entreprises qui aimeraient ça ouvrir demain, mais si c'est pour ouvrir demain pour devoir refermer dans trois semaines, ça va être bien pire que d'attendre encore un petit peu avant de rouvrir et de pouvoir rouvrir pour le bon. C'est un équilibre difficile, mais c'est aussi pour ça que le gouvernement fédéral a tellement investi pour aider les entreprises, pour aider les travailleurs, pour aider les familles, pour que, justement, ces décisions difficiles au niveau de l'économie soient plus faciles à prendre pour les provinces. On a été là pour les citoyens, pour les travailleurs, pour les entreprises, particulièrement les petites entreprises, et on va continuer de l'être. Merci. Je vais prendre une dernière question sur le téléphone. Operator? The next question is from David Aiken from Global News. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Thanks for taking our questions. Uh, to come back to the uh, concrete actions that I know you want to take on the, the six calls to action, 
that dealt with missing children and burial information. Um, one call to action, it's not the responsibility of the federal government, but for the other five, basically, it's all the government of Canada has begun discussions, has begun discussions, has begun discussions. I wonder, as Prime Minister, if you would insist with your ministers that they end those discussions and actually do something by, what, within a month, uh, two months, three months? Can you at least say when uh, any of these calls to action uh, will be completed? When will you tell your ministers to finish and put a check mark beside these calls to action? If it were only done by ministers, if it were only done by Ottawa to solve these challenges, might have been done long ago, but it would have been done wrong. You cannot move forward on true reconciliation, David, unless it is done in partnership with Indigenous communities, leaders, and individuals. And that's where these discussions that leave us, all of us, Indigenous Canadians, government, reporters, impatient around concrete actions, are so important. It is really important that as we move forward to understand and acknowledge the tragedies of the past, but mostly fix them for the future, that it be done in a way that is not a Band-Aid solution from Ottawa, mm -hmm. but that is generated in true partnership, in true reconciliation. And there have been lots of examples of exactly that moving forward. The Child and Family Services legislation we put forward just last year that makes sure that kids who are at risk in Indigenous communities don't get taken from Indigenous communities and put in a provincial system that takes away their language and the culture as we've seen too often, even over the past few years. That's why we co-developed that, that, that legislation with Indigenous peoples. And yes, it took longer to do because we had to work in partnership. But it's incredibly important that we get it right. Now, yes, we have to do these things as quickly as possible. People are impatient. People know that we need to move forward really and concretely on this. But it can't be just Ottawa saying, this is what we need to do. This is how you need to fix it. This is what the money is going to go for. It has to be done in true partnership. And that is one of the big lessons of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I am as impatient as you are to move forward on this, but not so impatient that I'm going to take shortcuts that are going to leave us uh, with uh, missed opportunities and further trauma uh, in the years to come. We are trying to move beyond this challenge together, and that's what we have to do together. Well, up to um, thank you, and, and uh, thank you, and and of course, um, you know that that whole missing child and burial information is looking at children of the last generation, perhaps, but there's a whole lot of current ch children of the current generation, Indigenous children, that the federal government is fighting in some sense, fighting in court against the St. Anne's residential school survivors, fighting in court to overturn a Canadian human rights tribunal, fighting in court about Jordan's principle, and many advocates, Indigenous advocates and, and, uh, and everyday Canadians wonder, why is the federal government doing this? It surely has the money to be able to compensate current, uh, to not compensate, but also provide health care for Indigenous children, why not just drop these lawsuits, write a check as a sign of good faith that Canada is interested in reconciliation? Well, first of all, David, on Jordan's principle, before we came to office, not one Jordan's principle request uh, was approved uh, by the government since we came in. Hundreds of thousands of Jordan's principal requests for uh, medical care and services for Indigenous children uh, have been requested. We have made significant movements on that. And in regards to the trauma of the past years that far too many Indigenous uh, young people have gone through, we recognize that. We also, as I've clearly said, know that there needs to be compensation for those young people. That is not what is at question here. The question is... Well, there are many questions, but one of them, for example, is should someone who uh, went to a day school for uh, a, a few days uh, in a few months or a few year or, or a year 
be compensated to the exact same amount as someone who is uh, in a uh, in a, a traumatic situation over many many years where they were taken from their families and and had a very very different experience right now the human rights tribunal says everyone should get exactly the same amount we don't know that that's entirely fair. We recognize that there are different levels of trauma and some people deserve much more compensation than others. Those are one of the things that we're working very hard with the communities to try and, to try and settle, to try and work through. Um, because it is important that the settlements be fair. Not just fair from an abstract meaning, but fair when you compare the trauma and the horrific experience that one uh, person might have gone through as compared to uh, a lesser trauma that someone else may have gone through. And this is difficult to talk about because trauma is trauma. But I think there is a recognition that there needs to be uh, a thoughtfulness put into making sure that the right compensation is given to everyone. And that is our focus. We have recognized the need to compensate kids uh, who face this trauma over the past years. That is not the question. The question is, what is the best and fairest way to do that? And on that, we are talking with the communities, with the, the families, with the advocates to try and figure out the right way forward. And I think that's what all Canadians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, would expect. Thank you. And that concludes today's press conference. Merci tout le monde.